Hi, uh, my name's Adam Beck. I'm a vascular surgeon at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm in the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy in the Department of Surgery. And I'm going to talk to you about aortic aneurysms today. Um, when a patient has an aortic aneurysm, and the aneurysm is essentially a weakening in the wall of the blood vessel. That a weakening allows the blood vessel to balloon up, and just like a balloon, it follows the same laws of physics. So as the balloon gets bigger, the wall tension goes up, the wall becomes thinner, uh, and there's a risk of rupture. Uh, the, every time I think about fixing an aortic aneurysm, I think of three things. Those things are What's the risk of doing nothing? So if we were to continue to follow the aneurysm over time, what would be the risk of, of rupture over that, over a period of time? And usually we put it into the context of a 12-month of a rupture risk. The second thing is, is what is the patient like? What's their overall health like? Um, what, what do we think their longevity of good life is? And the third thing is, is what's the risk of doing something? So if we decide we're going to fix this aneurysm, what would be the risk of that over time? So the first thing we think about, as I mentioned, is the, is the risk of doing nothing. And that's really related, related to the diameter of the aneurysm, as I pointed out. So the larger the aneurysm, the larger the rupture risk. So for women, the rupture risk is about 5% per year at 5 centimeters in size. So below 5 centimeters in, in diameter, the rupture risk is, is probably like 1% to 2% per year. For aneurysms that are 5.5 centimeters, uh, for a man, it would be 5% per year below that, 1% to 2% per year. As the aneurysm gets larger, the rupture risk goes up. So a six centimeter aneurysm in a man would have about a 10% rupture risk per year. So really that's the risk of, of doing nothing. And we obviously want to know that the patient is going to have a, a, a longevity of life that allows them to appreciate the risk of going through that operation. So if you had a patient that was 80 years old and had metastatic lung cancer and had an 11 centimeter aneurysm that you thought might rupture in the next six months, we might not repair that aneurysm because we, if they went through the repair, uh, they're just, they, they're going to go on and, and, um, and, and their lung cancer is going to cause their death. But if you have a younger patient, very healthy, uh, and we expect them to have a long, healthy life, it, it would make sense to repair that aneurysm, obviously. And so the third thing is, is really the, the core of all of this is, is, what is what's the risk of doing something? And in 2017, we have, the, we have several things at our disposal, but very basically the, the, uh, those things are a minimally invasive repair or endovascular repair, and the second thing is an open repair. And I'll talk to you about open repair first. And in and, uh, open repair, there's really no magic to it. We have to get to the aorta. We have to stop the blood flow through the diseased tissue and then, and then we repair the diseased aorta. Uh, if we had an aneurysm that was a weakening in a wall of a straight blood vessel just like this, if I was going to repair that aneurysm with an open repair wherever it is in the body, I've got to expose that portion of the body, place clamps on the aorta, so we would have to put clamps here and here and then rep replace the diseased blood vessel in between. If I, used, if I was going to use a stent to repair the aneurysm or a minimally invasive repair, we would use a, a stent. This is a stent. And a stent is essentially just a wire mesh structure that is placed over a wire. It's contained inside of a catheter. And uh, we deliver the, the stent in the catheter over the wire and we deploy it inside of the, of the uh, blockage and it just pushes the blockage off to the side and establishes a new flow lumen, and that's a stent. This is a stent graft, and a stent graft is essentially the same thing, it's just got covering on the outside of it, and that covering, uh, the difference is, is that blood can flow through this tube, so you can see that blood can flow through that tube, uh, but it can't flow out through the interstices of the stent. So this is an aortic stent graft, one version of an aortic stent graft. And there are another number of these on the market that are FDA approved. And this one in particular uh, is used to treat an infrarenal aortic aneurysm. So in order to establish a, a successful minimally invasive repair, we have to meet two engineering concepts. And those concepts are seal and fixation. So if I had an aneurysm like this one, this, is, this would be called an infrarenal aneurysm, so below the kidney arteries, these are the renal arteries here. As long as I've got a, a neck of tissue here below the renal arteries, I can seal 
above and below the aneurysm so that there's no flow into the aneurysm. And of course, we want the device to remain fixated so that it doesn't move after we put it in place. So this would be a stent below the renal arteries. And these are modular stents. So this would have a um, limb that would extend from this limb into the iliac artery and from this limb into the iliac artery. So an aneurysm like this one would be fairly low risk of repair. So the risk of mortality of an operation of an infrarenal aneurysm repair is, is in a well-chosen patient is less than 1%. So if we approximate that 1% risk of mortality and a very low risk of, of uh, complications from that operation, then it may make sense to fix that aneurysm in a, in a younger patient with, with a long life. The complexity becomes when the aneurysm becomes more complex. So if I had an aneurysm, and I'm going to draw one here that would be called a thoracoabdominal aneurysm, and that's just an anatomic description of where the aneurysm is. This, so thoracoabdominal means that it extends from the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity. And these can be of any variety of extent. They can involve the entirety of the aorta, which is essentially what I've drawn here, uh, or they can be focal anywhere along the way. And we have a, a classification system that we use to define where these aneurysms are located. So this aneurysm extends from here in the proximal descending thoracic aorta into the infrarenal aorta here. And so this is a very extensive aneurysm. And in order to fix this aneurysm, if I want to achieve seal and fixation, as I mentioned before, I would have to seal here near the blood vessels that, um, that provide blood flow to the brain and arms, and here near the blood vessels that provide blood flow to the, to the uh, pelvis. And so we would have to cover up the blood vessels to the intestines and kidneys. So if I just took a stent graft like this one and extended it through the entire thoracic aorta and just placed modular stents all the way through, I would be covering the blood vessels to the intestines and kidneys and uh, the patient would die from that. So we obviously can't do that. So sometimes we'll use stents like these. We'll see if I can hold this up so you can see it, um, th that have holes in them. And I don't, it, it looks like you can appreciate that, that there are holes in the side. And those holes that you see there are for the renal arteries. And you can see if you look really closely, there are little marks on there that are made of gold. And that is what we see on the, on the fluoroscopy in the operating room. And then there's a, a little um, carved out portion at the top of it that would be for the superior mesenteric artery or the blood vessel that uh, extends to the, to the um, intestines here. Well, this aneurysm couldn't be treated that way because we would not be able to achieve seal and fixation, as I mentioned before, as the, uh, as the most important tenets of an endovascular aneurysm repair. So sometimes we'll use a stent like this one. And this one has got branches and fenestrations on it. And so if you look very closely at this, you can see that there are uh, branches extending from the, um, from the stent graft here and there's a fenestration here, and these are custom made for, the, for a patient's anatomy. And there's a, you can see at the top of that graft is a, what we would call a scallop. Here there are wires that um, provide fixation for the device and center the device in the aorta. And then here's another branch down here. So everybody's anatomy is different, um, but these stents are, uh, are made specific to the patient's anatomy. And these little branches on this thing, let me hold it up here again for you, these little branches are not intended to actually extend into the branch vessels, what they do is they allow a, a docking place for a stent graft that extends out into the branch vessel. So for the patient that I've drawn on the screen here, we would have stents that extend all the way down. I'll draw a first stent, which is just a tube here. And then we would place a, a custom device that would extend all the way down here and you would have little branches that extended out into the branch vessels to the intestines and kidneys. Here, another, and these would be the small stents, stent grafts that I showed you earlier. And then we would have another modular component that would allow us to extend all the way into the patient's iliac arteries here. And as long as we achieve seal and fixation of this device above and below the aneurysm, this aneurysm will, over time, will clot. 
around the stent graft is our hope and then uh, blood flow will be through the through the stent graft and the aneurysm can't rupture and so this is the type of, of uh, therapy that we can provide some patients depending on their anatomy and there are some patients that we think are too high risk even for this type of repair um, and there are some patients that we think are too young uh, because we have to we have to assume that these devices are going to are going to outlast the the patient so if you had a very young patient with a connective tissue disorder for example we might want um, the patient to uh, we might want the, we, the patient to undergo an open repair rather than a minimally invasive repair and then the last thing I'll point out about all of this is that uh, the one of the most important things that we do when we interact with a patient in our vascular surgery clinic is to is to talk to them about the risk factors that uh, that got them where they are. So the most, one of the most common risk factors for aortic aneurysm disease is smoking. Uh, there are genetic components to uh, having aortic aneurysms. There's also uh, risk associated with having uncontrolled hypertension or hypercholesterolemia. And um, there are some patients who have connective tissue disorders like Marfan or Ehlers-Danlos or uh, something called Lois Dietz uh, syndrome among others that, that have a higher risk of, of aortic aneurysm. And um, for, for our patients, we want to mitigate any of those risk factors that they have. And so we will always talk to our patients about smoking cessation in clinic, uh, even if they've heard it before and if they've failed before. And that's usually a, an integral part of that, of that discussion. The treatment and repair of aortic aneurysms really is a multidisciplinary um, disease tr treatment. And, and at UAB, we provide uh, multidisciplinary care. And this does not just involve the, the surgeon and their abilities, but it also involves the, the nursing staff, the ICU staff, the cardiac anesthesiologists, uh, sometimes a collaborative approach between cardiovascular surgeons and vascular surgeons. And at UAB, we really provide you the, uh, the best multidisciplinary care that we can. Um, if you have a patient that needs to be referred to UAB, or uh, we would ask that you refer them as early as you, as you first see them with aortic aneurysm. So even if you look at their aneurysm and it's small, sometimes we can help counsel the patients about risk factor reduction and, and medical management of their aneurysms before it's time for them to be repaired. And as I pointed out, um, we do have a lot of advanced technology to treat these patients sometimes. And, and even if you think your patient is, is uh, older and has medical comorbidities that might make them high risk for a repair, sometimes we can even treat those patients with a minimally invasive repair and, and prolong their, their length of good life. Um, referral to UAB is, is uh, easy. If you call the 1-800-UAB-MIST, M-I-S-T line, uh, we can uh, get your patient in and, and seen um, usually within a couple of weeks.